All right, well, thanks for tuning into our podcast. My name's Dr. Eden Robertson. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the School of Clinical Medicine at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And I'm very privileged to be here today with Chris Pierce. Chris is a parent to a young adult with SCN2A and has set up a charity to fund research and support families with SCN2A. So Chris works with the Epilepsy Foundation as the rare epilepsy lead, advocating for greater recognition and better services. So Chris, for listeners who are new to the field of developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, or DEEs, can you give us a little overview of what they are, what that means? Yeah, thanks, Eden. Um, So DEEs, I will refer to them as, um, are not well understood. And so it's really um, difficult for families who get a diagnosis to not only understand it themselves, but also the people around them. So DEEs are the most severe group of epilepsies with a high mortality and profound morbidity. They cause um, a lot of impact on those that are diagnosed with them. The onset is usually in infancy or childhood with treatment resistant seizures. They often have abnormal EEGs and they have development which which slows or can regress and they often have cognitive impairment. So you can see they're very complex conditions. There are a number of different causes for DEEs, but a genetic mutation is usually the most common, causing conditions like what my son has, SCN2A, SYNGAP1 or KCNQ2, or as we call it in the amongst parents, the, alf- the alphabet soup. Um, and every DE is different, but there's a lot of common challenges between these, which is why we often work together. So alongside high seizure frequency, other common challenges are developmental delay, which we mentioned, impaired communication skills, behavioural issues, loss of motor skills. A lot of these children have or are on the autism spectrum. They have gastrointestinal issues. Many um, are fed through tubes. They also can have visual impairment, respiratory issues, orthopedic issues, and often this list goes on and it's, you know, often trying to put out fires with these children and and just try and maintain their health. And the issue uh, again is um, often these seizures with DEEs are very hard to treat. So even though anti-seizure medications always first line of treatment for this epilepsy, gaining control with seizures for DEEs may not be achieved or can be quite challenging. And so the type of treatment that the child receives with a DE can be quite different between each of the different genetic DEs like SCN2A or KCNQ2 because the underlying mechanisms are different. So one's a sodium channel, one's a potassium channel. So we need to look um, at getting that diagnosis because it can inform treatments. Um, And while you, you you may get seizure control in some of some DEs, um, this is a really important goal, but we, we need better treatments at the minute. Treatments for DEEs are very few and far between, and there's a lot of new and novel treatments being explored um, that are providing hope to families. But while we wait for this, these complex conditions need a lot of support and improved care models um, to make sure the outcomes as best as possible. Thank you so much. And that's so fascinating to hear about all the intricacies about the genetic cause and then the implications for the symptoms and then ultimately the management. And obviously such a complex condition with a significant impact, not just on the child with a DE, but also the caregivers and family members who support those children. So I know within the healthcare space for many complex health conditions in childhood, and especially when we look at the rare disease space, the burden on caregivers can be absolutely immense. And obviously being an unpaid caregiver in many of these scenarios, Um, and particularly, I think, like you mentioned, the rarity of each DE, it's really challenging for caregivers to understand the intricacies of their child's specific condition and ultimately then access relevant and reliable we, we, we talk about um, the explosion of genomics and that, that what that means is that we, um, we we are now understanding what causes these severe and complex epilepsies. It's, it's a gene in general, uh, or more, most commonly it's a genetic um, mutation that's caused um, these conditions. So that means we get a diagnosis. Um, for my son, it took 14 years because we didn't have that understanding. Families now get that diagnosis within a couple of weeks if they present in the same way my son did, which was really catastrophic seizures, ongoing, can't control them, and sort of the the other pieces falling around it, like um, lack of of growth and um, not meeting milestones as a baby or an infant. 
So that DE diagnosis, particularly when your child's so done, it basically changes your trajectory as a parent. It changes the role that you play for your child because you often become um, not only the caregiver, but you become the case manager and the coordinator of that child's care. Because um, when when we just spoke earlier, we talked earlier, we were talking about gastro, we're talking about respiratory, we're talking about movement. These parents need to go and see doctors or therapists in all these areas. It's not easy and they're coordinating that themselves. So you can only imagine the impact of that on a parent. They've been thrown into a world of rare disease, like you mentioned. Not much is known about these conditions. So they're trying to find out what it is, as well as educating all the people that are supporting them as well. But it is it is um, because the DEs are not well recognised, the health system doesn't almost doesn't know how to support them. It's not like if you've got a cancer diagnosis or you've got cystic fibrosis, these conditions are quite well known. Not saying they're easy or anything, but they're quite well known. So there are already supports and infrastructure and scaffolding set up to support these families, whereas DEs are, are still quite unknown, even though we understand the science better. A lot, a lot of these kitchen conditions are so rare that people just, the doctors, um, nurses and um, people within the healthcare system just don't understand it. So you're learning together. And that's a lot of pressure to put on a parent or a sibling or a grandparent. It's, it's a lot. And so therefore you will find that caregivers um, will have an impact on the health. You find caregiver fatigue. And I, I can say through my previous work that that is absolutely evident. But I can also say from a personal experience that my health suffered, that's mental, physical, um, you know, as a full-time carer for 20 years, and that takes its toll. And um, it's it's really important to make sure that we look at that side of of the DEE story. So yeah, it's a it's a big thing. Thank you for sharing that. I think your voice is so critical in this work because you have. I suppose those two hats where you can look at it from the evidence-based perspective as a health professional working in this space, but also as a parent having had that lived experience and connections with the community who have gone through um, kind of these challenges. And so I think what you've touched on there really is what led us to develop and evaluate an information linker service called Gene Compass for caregivers who have a child with a DEE. So the program centred around this um, service that we invited caregivers to submit questions that they may have about their child's condition. So we weren't providing the medical service, which meant that there was no treatment related questions um, submitted to our service. And the way that I like to describe it to families that came on board Gene Compass was that it removed the need for them to have to turn to Google or the research literature themselves and ultimately have to decipher what it meant for them. We removed that burden by giving them the service, by providing them the easy to understand report that it answered exactly what they wanted to know about their child's condition. And we made sure that information was in easy read format and it was also high quality. So they knew that that information they were receiving was reliable information. Yeah, um, it's really been great to be part of this project from conception, which was a few, you know, we've been working on this for a yeah. few years. Um, for our listeners, what findings have come out of this study so far? Yeah, so we were able to publish our protocol paper last year and then just recently published our first data paper from the Gene Compass Project in the Journal of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. So in that manuscript titled Quality of Life in Caregivers of a Child with a Developmental and Epileptic Encephalopathy, we've reported on 72 caregivers across Australia who've consented to participate in this information linker service and they completed their baseline questionnaire. Um, so as typical in psychosocial research, most participants were mothers. They were fairly highly educated and from metropolitan areas. We found that there was quite a range of diagnoses um, and also there were some parents specifying that they knew the genetic etiology or the cause of their child's condition, such as SCN2A or KCNQ2, but not all were actually able to provide that causative gene um, in their questionnaire. So in this first paper that we've just published, we looked at social care related quality of life, which is really the individual's quality of life, so parents' care quality of life in the context of caring for their child and whether that was related to their perceptions of their child's illness, their level of health literacy, their caregiver activation or what is defined as like their confidence to engage with the healthcare system. Yeah, so when you um, refer to illness perceptions, what do you mean there? 
Yeah, so illness perceptions is quite a broad concept. And so for this study, we used a measure called the Brief Illness Perception Questionnaire. And basically this measures three domains that underlie an individual's perception of illness, whether their own or, or another individual. So in this case, the parents, um, the child's illness. And so the first is cognitive, which looks at how threatening an individual perceives an illness, such as the extent of symptoms, the impact of treatment, then there's the more the emotional representation of illness. How much emotional impact does that illness have on the parents? So how much concern or distress do they have thinking about the illness? And then the third domain is coherence. How much do they perceive that they understand the illness? That's really interesting. Okay, so what did you find? So the first was that, that there was a really wide range of social care related quality of life scores. So some caregivers scored or indicated to us that they had really high needs, they, they had a poor quality of life, they really had a lot of challenges they needed support with, but others were considered at an ideal stage. And I think that what that shows me is that we can learn from the caregivers that are doing really well and are at an ideal stage and see what are they doing? What social support and structures around them do they have that we can implement and support those other families? Um, one of the highest needs were regarding being able to look after themselves. So caregivers felt they weren't able to take care of themselves, engage in self-care strategies or engage in activities that they enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I can certainly relate to that in, in some of the more recent work I've done where we've been working with parents and you can see how they lift each other up by that example. So, you know, I mean, I've seen that kind of what you found in this, um, this your research that is, that is actually happening in real life, so that's great. So was there a link between quality of life and illness perceptions? With our key findings, we had a, a pretty small sample size, so we weren't able to do some um, kind of uh, basic analyses. But what we did find was that um, for the outcomes measures, we found quality of life was related to both the cognitive and the emotional perceptions of illness, but it wasn't related to coherence. So it didn't relate to health literacy or activation either. So what that's really telling us is that we could improve caregivers cognitive and emotional perceptions of their child's illness. So their perception of how well treatment's working or how much distress they're experiencing regarding their child's illness. And that would ultimately improve their quality of life. That's really interesting. Um, so what, ca what can we do to improve the cognitive and emotional perceptions um, of their childhood illness? Because it sounds like it's something we can really work on. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what's so great about these findings is that it's the perceptions of their child's illness. There was some other research that's been recently published that shows that the number of seizures doesn't actually impact um, the parent's quality of life as much as their perceptions of their child's illness and the perceptions of the severity of the seizures. So I think it, it shows there that the psychological aspect of the target for interventions being psychological may actually be really um, beneficial for these families. So I think a single intervention alone isn't enough to support these families. Um, you know, one intervention that supports their emotional perceptions, that's not going to be enough. We need to have kind of a, a, an amalgamation of resources available for these families. Positive psychology based interventions that help families reframe their situation or strengthen parents' ability to engage in activities that they enjoy alongside other clinical and psychosocial supports are likely to be of benefit and ultimately improve their quality of life. Sounds like we're writing our next research project. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, um, I, I think this is a fantastic piece of work because, you know, we can all say we feel that this is happening and um, that there is an impact on quality of life. But to be able to unpack that and be able to pull out those like kind of the the, the areas that we can actually build some strategies around is really helpful those, for those of us who are working in the space trying to improve outcomes, not only for the child who has um, the DE, but also for the caregivers that do, you know, ha have a different, like I said at the start, a different trajectory as a parent. It's not what they expected. And often that also comes into play that, you know, parenting is not how they envisaged um, their, their role as a parent was going to look like. So, um, really like at this point to thank you for your time, uh, for, for the work in this space and, and working together with the consumers because it's really been a project in partnership, which is um, fantastic to see. Thanks, Chris. You touched on there um, something that I find so important is until there is a cure that becomes available to 
to support all of these families, we really do need to be focusing on the quality of life of both the child and the whole family, including the caregivers. Um, so, I mean, from, from my perspective, I really appreciate your words and your contributions to this project over the past several years, as well as your time today to chat. The success of this project really has been dependent on having caregivers like yourself contribute to the underlying development of the Gene Compass intervention, and then ultimately how we evaluated it and connected with the families to find out what it meant to them. So for listeners, you can now download our open access manuscript, Quality of Life in Caregivers of a Child with a Developmental and Epileptic Encephalopathy. And stay tuned for the findings of our Gene Compass pilot evaluation. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.